Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our live audience here in San Francisco and our radio and online audiences. It's my great pleasure to introduce Kelvin Chin, our speaker today, speaking on overcoming the fear of death. Um, Kelvin and I go way back. Um, we, we met in college uh, many years ago, and uh, we've been friends ever since. And he has uh, had a, a, a lustrous career in the legal services field. He was vice president of the American Arbitration Association in Los Angeles for 10 years, etc., etc. But now what he's doing is uh, he's founded a foundation for overcoming the fear of death, something we obviously all face. Um, and as I started talking about it fairly recently. So uh, I invited him here to talk about it. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. So as soon as he's done, we'll start with that. Thank you very much, Kelvin Chin. Thank you, George. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. I want to acknowledge that it may have taken some courage for, for you to come to this lecture today, uh, aside from the obvious courage of dealing with San Francisco traffic and <laughs> that type of thing. But, and I know some of you traveled some distance to get here, and some even flew in uh, to hear the lecture today. But seriously, uh, with such a full house, I think it is uh, especially of note to acknowledge the courage for, uh, that everybody has to come today. Because think about it, the fear of death is something that we generally don't like thinking about it. I mean, to really be honest, it's not something that we think about like thinking about, certainly, every day. Although some of us may think about it more often than we like. It is something that is there in our minds. It's the proverbial elephant in the room, isn't it? It's, the, it's that big thing over there that we hope that maybe if we don't pay attention to, it'll go away. But it kind of is there, and it subconsciously is there, I think, more than we realize as well. Uh, it, I was thinking, um, but George was right, I, I like to walk around. Hold on a second. I'm going to get this microphone out of the cradle. Um, I was thinking the other day, you know, as a culture, if we're thinking about stuff, what's a, what's a parameter? What's an interesting measure to measure how much we think about things? And I thought, jokes. So I Googled, I literally did this, I Googled how many fear of jokes, fear of death jokes are out there. And you know what I got? 96 million is what I got results. That's a big number. So that's just a data point for me to uh, give it as an example of how much we really do think about it. And of course, one, one of the jokes I like jumped out at me a little bit uh, from Woody Allen. And of course, you have to forgive my non, what is, is he from Brooklyn? He's from New York, but his accent, you know. But what did he say? Woody Allen said, so I'm, not I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Woody Allen, right? But seriously, people ask me, you know, why, why, Kel, why did you create this foundation on overcoming the fear of death? And because, think about it, what's fear? What does fear do to us? Fear contracts us. It limits us. It drains our energy. It sometimes seems to make us do things that may be not so healthy for us. So I thought, wow, what if we could reduce fear, and in this case, the big one, fear of death, what if we could reduce it somewhat, incrementally, maybe even eliminate it, but at least reduce it somewhat. Think about what would what that would do, what that would free up in terms of our energy that we as species could use in so many other different areas. I mean, I'm not an expert in subject matter so much, but somebody could come up with the cure for cancer. Somebody could come up with some incredible alternative energy that's incredibly cheap. Uh, 
somebody could help with the water issue here in California and come up with some really economical way to distill seawater. Or just on a more personal level, you could use the energy for your personal relationships or more productivity at work or you know, connecting with your kids better. So this energy, freeing up this energy, I thought, well, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a really practical, helpful thing that maybe I can do add my little effort, so to speak, to move the proverbial uh, needle more a little bit on the positive level, um, because I can help people reduce their fear of death. And when I talk about this, you can kind of get a sense probably that I think about things and I think about things from a perspective that's maybe somewhat idealistic, but I'm a pragmatic idealist. I, there's this realist side to me. So I just want to acknowledge also, right at the outset, before we get into the substance, the content of what we're going to be talking about today, that it's not like we can expect to hear this lecture, walk out of the room, and then, you know, our fear of death is completely gone. You know, I'm a realist. It's incremental. So what I suggest is that you hear what we're having to say today, Think about it. It's the beginning of an ongoing discussion, is the way I look at it. It's an ongoing discussion with yourself, with your friends, your loved ones, with me perhaps. But essentially, it's a, it's a discussion that you're going to have to have within yourself. And that's the important discussion. But it's an ongoing discussion. It's incremental. See where it goes. The other thing that I want to say before I get right into the meat of the discussion today is that what I'm saying does not rely on any beliefs at all. In other words, you do not have to believe anything specific about death or about how you view death uh, in order to overcome your fear of death. I am going to talk, and that I'm going to talk about four different belief systems. And pretty, they pretty much cover the landscape. I'm going to talk for about another 25 minutes or so, and I want to leave a lot of time at the end for questions so that you can engage and uh, think about this and ask what you want to hear about. But no religious beliefs, no beliefs about death, nothing is required here. Whatever your belief is, you can have that belief. And what I do is I embrace all beliefs, and what I do is help people look through the lens of their belief system and help them overcome the fear of death. Okay? Make sense? So, people have asked me, you know, about these belief systems, and I said, okay, let's just lay them out one by one and then talk about them. So the first belief system is kind of the obvious belief system, and a lot of people have it, which is, my body dies, my mind dies. That's it. Lights out, I'm done. Okay, that's my father's belief system, and we'll come back to my father stories in a minute. But that's belief system number one. Belief system number two is, my body dies, my mind continues, but it scares me. It scares me because I, I don't know what's going to happen, and I'm a little bit freaked out. All right, that's belief system number two. We'll come back to these. Belief system number three, my body dies, my mind continues, transitions to something. I'm not exactly sure what, but I'm not scared. Okay, that's number three. Belief system number four, my body dies, my mind continues, and my belief is that my mind continues to some transitional place, and at some point, I can choose to come back in another body. The notion of reincarnation, past lives, future lives, that's the fourth belief system. All right, so we're going to talk about all of these and look through the lens of each one, and we're going to show how no need to fear death. Okay. 
So, first belief system. My father's belief system. Body dies, mind dies, that's it. Lights, turn the lights off. So, picture my dad, first of all. Step back for a second. So, my dad is, was, this five foot five, five six guy. So those of you in the room can tell that I'm a little bit taller than that. Um, I outgrew my mom. She was five foot even. Um, I think in the fourth grade, I outgrew my dad in the fifth or sixth grade. Uh, my, just as an aside, my mom loved that because I remember going to a party. I digress. My mom, my, my, we were going to a party once, and and uh, these people hadn't seen my mom for many decades, and they um, said, "Oh, is this your younger brother?" How awesome is that, <laughs> right? Right. Anyway, so, so back to my father. My father's like this five foot five, five six guy, um, engineer. Any engineers in the room? So, uh, my father was an engineer, mechanical engineer, and he was a World War II vet, and he was very proud of that. He served in the South Pacific, in. Uh, uh, in the U.S. Air, uh, what was called the U.S. Army Air Corps then, because those of you who uh, know about that part of our history, there was no U.S. Air Force then. It was called the U.S. Army Air Corps. But he was in the equivalent of the U.S. Air Force then. Vet, very proud of it. Always had his World War II vet baseball cap on. So this is a picture of my dad, five five, five six, World War II vet baseball cap, cigar hanging out of a shiner's ball. So he talked like this. And uh, so I was always hanging out on the side of his mouth. He had a cigar. And uh, probably 80% of the time it was not lit. And But here to talk. So if you ask my dad, uh, what do you think about death, Henry? He would say, ah, stick me in a box, throw the dirt on me, turn the lights out, I'm done. You know, that was my dad's belief. A lot of people believe that. Think about that. What happens when we die? One of two things is going to happen. First of all, I think we can all agree that at some point the body is going to end its life, like the life support system and the body's going to turn off. The body's going to die at some point. But what happens? One of two things is going to happen when that happens. Either we're going to cease to exist or we're going to continue to exist, right? One of those two things. And when I say we, what am I referring to? I'm referring to our mind <coughs> is going to either cease to exist or continue to exist. So my, body, my, my father's belief system, his body has died, his mind is dead. That's his belief system. Well, in that belief system, he's no longer continuing to exist, is he? <laughs> so, and what is fear? Let's just define fear real quickly here. Fear is the emotion associated with the anticipation of unhappiness. Well, after my father's body has died in his belief system, his mind no longer exists, it can no longer experience happiness or unhappiness for that matter, he has no need to fear death. No need to fear death if you have that belief system. Now, we can come back and have other discussions about other fears that may be related, but for clarity purposes, no need to fear death. And I'm all about clarity because it's important to understand what our fears are really of. Because a lot of us are walking around conflating and confusing our fears, thinking, oh, I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that. But it's really we're afraid of this and we're not afraid of all these other things. And we're carrying around all this energy of fear of being afraid of stuff that we're not even afraid of, really, if you think about it. So it's a lot of wasteful energy. So I'm all about clarity here. So my dad, no need to fear death with that belief system. Okay, second belief system. My body dies, my mind continues, and I am scared of what may happen after that. All right, so what's going on there? Is that really the fear of death? It's not the fear of death, but it's a related fear, and I want to talk about it. So we renamed that, and I call it the fear of continued existence or it's the fear of after death, whatever you want to call it. But I call it the fear of continued existence because in that case, the person's belief is their body has died, their mind is continuing. But look behind the curtain a little bit and what 
are they really afraid of? Afraid of the unknown? Afraid of not knowing perhaps whether they're going to have enough control over their life after their body has died? Those types of things are really what's driving it, right? So what I like to talk about in terms of possible solution for this fear of continued existence is this idea of overcoming the fear of death through virtue. Now, what do I mean by virtue? I'll tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean the current thinking of, thinking about virtue. Don't get too close to that loudspeaker, I guess. Sorry about that. Um, I don't mean the current thinking of virtue, which is, do this, don't do that. It's a set of rules. Most people, when you think of virtue, you think, oh, I gotta be like this way. I, gotta not, I, I shouldn't do that. It's like a behavioral set of rules or, or an attitudinal set of rules. <coughs> do this, don't do that. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ancient Greek sense of virtue. And what was the ancient Greek sense of virtue? The ancient Greek sense of virtue was turn within, go within, Get to know yourself. Know thyself. Ever heard of that phrase, right? We've all heard of that. Know thyself. Get to know what makes you tick. What is it about your personality, for example, that makes you unique? Because we're all unique. What makes you unique from somebody else who's in the same situation but has a totally different reaction, totally different interpretation, sees the same movie even, totally different experience? What makes your personality unique and different? Knowing oneself, turning within, really getting to know oneself <coughs> on a very, very deep level. And then, in this ancient Greek notion, notion of virtue, understand oneself better, therefore one's thoughts, one's actions become more effective, we're happier, more productive human beings. So internal first, then external application and experience and enjoyment of life. This is the ancient Greek notion of virtue. So think about it in this context of what we're talking about, overcoming the fear of death and overcoming the fear of death in the specific instance of the fear of continued existence. It makes a lot of sense, right? Because if we can somehow improve ourselves internally, <laughs> and go inside out in that way, then what's a natural side effect of that? Increased self-confidence, inner strength, stability, centeredness, all these kinds of words, all these kinds of concepts that we hear. Well, if that's the case, our fear of, our no of the unknown will reduce, 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 <coughs> possibly even eliminate, overcome the fear of continued existence, because if one's that self-confident, it doesn't matter what happens afterwards. We know that our confidence level is high enough, so we know that we can handle it, whatever the it might be, okay? So that's the solution, possible solution for overcoming this fear of continued existence. That's number two. Number three. Body dies, this is number three belief system. Body dies, mind continues, but I'm not, I'm not afraid of anything. My mind continues. I'm good with it, it's all right. But I don't know what it's transitioning to. It's still an unknown, but I'm okay with it. I have a high enough level of inner confidence and so forth, that, yeah, that's okay. I, I, I'll handle it. I'm curious, though. Anybody here ever had an NDE or near-death experience? Yeah. So NDE is the acronym for near-death experience. Every once in a while, somebody will raise their hands uh, and have one. So I'll give you an example. So when I was in college, a college uh, buddy of mine who he and I later became roommates in graduate school, 
he told me when he was actually eight or nine years old, I just called him, uh, literally called him before this, like, like last week before this lecture, just to confirm, I said, am I getting the facts right? Um, it happened, it's an interesting story. He, he, he was eight or nine years old at the time this happened. And he had had his tonsils out. Anybody ever had their tonsils out? I mean, it's, this is fairly common, you know, surgical procedure. He had his tonsils out. He went home. His mom felt bad for him because poor little Henry had just had his tonsils out, so she gave him a cookie. <laughs> Not a good idea. The cookie was a little bit sharp. Opened up the suture, the wound. He starts hemorrhaging. So, and at that point, nobody knows what's going on. He's just uh, obviously not well. And, but his mental experience was that he went up onto the ceiling. That's, this is how he described me. He said, I felt like I was up on the, on the ceiling, looking down at everybody, and my mom's freaking out, and the doctors are coming, and all of this is going on. He's observing all this. He hears clearly all the conversations are going on. When he came back, he told them what he'd heard them say. Um, but he was not in good physical condition. There, 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 ha there are other near-death experiences where I I've talked to people where they're, what's the term? Is, is it code when you're actually coded? Is that, is that, is that, is that yeah. the? Yeah. Coded. So they were coded, which means Right? Just, and they're dead, and, hey, right? And electric shock. Yeah, and they, oh, they, and they have to be electric shocked back to, li back, back to life. Okay, so I was talking to this other gentleman. Jay was telling me that this happened to him a number of years ago. And he remembers that, the whole experience. He remembers all the conversations. And uh, he came back into his body. So, what's my point of raising these things? Well. They're just, to me, it's like, it's curious. It's interesting to hear. It poses, it, 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 it poses questions in our minds and, and provides possibilities, I think, to us. For those of you who've never heard of this before, never mind experienced it, all I'm saying is, hmm, interesting, right? A little bit inexplicable in terms of the normal, rational way of looking at, at, at the world. But there are tens of thousands of these that are medically documented cases. Tens of thousands. So it's kind of like, hmm, interesting. I wonder. I wonder if something does continue after the body dies. People have had these experiences. Um, back to my father. So my father passed away. This was. 15, 16 years ago. And um, as I said, he was a World War II vet. So he wanted his ashes taken to the military cemetery in uh, above Waikiki in Honolulu. People know the Punch Bowl? Everybody ever been there? It's uh, a lot of people, yeah. It, the Punch Bowl is, a, it, they call it the Punch Bowl. It's the National <laughs> Cemetery, the military of the Pacific, right? So, but the local vernacular, they call it the punch bowl. Why? Because it, it's this <coughs> extinct volcanic volcano. And so it's in a crater. And it overlooks Waikiki. It's beautiful. And um, anyway, so we take his ashes there. I arrange the whole thing. I have several siblings. At the time, all of our children were very young. And so there's a logistical issue. You know, you coordinate your families. Those of you who have families, you know what it's like. You know, you're trying to do this trip with several siblings and so forth, with their children and their spouses and the work schedule and all that. So we get there. And we decide to meet on the beach at the Moana Surfrider Hotel, right there, Waikiki Beach. And we're staying at the Sheraton Princess, which is, uh, or Sheraton Kalani or something, uh, right across the street. So we meet at the, at the Moana Surfrider Beach. Because we're getting there at different times. So we figure, well, with little kids, that's a great babysitter. The beach is always a great babysitter, right? So, so we get there. Everybody's there, flying in from different geographic regions. And we figure, you know what? The ceremony's tomorrow. We just want this to be easy. 
especially with the kids. The last thing you want is like really hungry kids who've been traveling all day. So let's just go eat at the Chinese restaurant in the ground floor and off the lobby of our uh, hotel at Sheridan across the street. Great. So we go there. We go right there. Sandy, uh, bathing suits, little kids, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and those of you who have children know. Well, then we ordered the food, and I thought, you know what? This is a good opportunity. I'll take Sammy, my daughter, uh, who's now at San Francisco State. Um, I'll take her. She was five years old. I'll take her upstairs and just change her out and wash her off, get her in her pajamas so she didn't be ready. So food had been ordered. We're doing that while they're cooking the food. We go back downstairs, finish eating. A couple hours later, we're done. And my sister is the one in the family who does not have children. So she's like the best aunt. So she goes, <laughs> Lorinda goes, I'll take the kids to the gift shop. Uh, all right, okay, great. So you know what? I'm going to take Sammy up and put her to bed. So I go upstairs, and here's what I see. The door in the hotel room is all the way swung open. Hotel room's dark. On the doorstop, it had one of these magnetic doorstops so that probably for the cleaning people, they can open the door and just, or maybe if, even yourself, if you're checking in, you can get your luggage in easier. It's all the way magnetized open. I know I didn't leave the door like that when I left. I, I travel a lot. I've traveled a lot for decades uh, for business. I'm very careful about making sure that not only is the door shut, but I go like this and shake the door handle, make sure it's locked clicked, locked. So the room is dark, pitch black. We have four suitcases in there, and they're spread all over the place. Because you know, it's not a huge room, and there's four of us, and we've got four suitcases. And my suitcase is the one right next to the front door. On top of my suitcase is my expensive scuba regulator. They, somebody easily could just pick it up and walk. Nothing is touched in the room. So I call downstairs security. Two Hawaiian guys come up, the security guys. They plug the keyboard right into the lock, and they can do this electronic thing, and they can tell whose key was the last key open at what time. It was my key at 20 minutes of eight. So, so I say to him, I said, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Uh, you know, we're here to go up to the punch bowl tomorrow morning. We've got a ceremony with my dad's ashes, and these Hawaiian guys look at me, and they go, bro, it's your dad. <laughs> they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, it's your dad. He's, he's messing with you. You know, so because you know Hawaiians believe in spirit and so forth. These are native Hawaiian guys, and um, so that's the first thing that happened. The next morning, we wake up in the room, and uh, we're going to go eat breakfast and go up to do the ceremony at ten thirty. So we're getting uh, we're getting up at you know seven thirty eight o'clock, eat breakfast, and I go into the uh, the safe. You know, I have a you know, four digit code. Punch that in pull my wallet out, shut the door. Ah, dang it. I, I forgot that I have four coupons for free meal that are in there. And we're going to a different island after that, so this is the only opportunity to use these four coupons, free meal. So, so, I, so this is literally like three seconds later. I go and I, and the digital screen is off. And I thought, oh, electricity's off in the hotel, great. I try to turn the TV on, TV doesn't work. And Jesse, who's here today, who was then 10 years old at the time, I said, Jesse, go, go, go turn, he's my son, uh, go, go, go turn on the, uh, the, the, try the lights in the bathroom. Maybe, maybe it's like the hotel's off. The, light, the lights work there, the light works at the, at the bed. It's just right here where, where I am. And so because of what happened the night before, I look on the other side of the big hunk of furniture there, you know. I look on the other side of the power strip, and I'm looking at the power strip at that little red button, the on-off switch, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to touch it. I'm just going to look first. Maybe it's a loose connection. It's like halfway or something. It's all the way turned off. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is we go down and we eat breakfast. So we're done eating breakfast. I give them the coupons, and you know, I, you know, I always tip people. I, I'm probably an over tipper. So I, I tip them, and I tip them on the full value of the four coupons. And the kid comes back to get the tip. And he's about 17, 18 years old or something, some eight Hawaiian kid. 
And he walks away, and I said, guys, did you, did you, did you see his name? Which was my dad's name, which is an odd name for anybody of that generation who's 17 years old, never mind a Hawaiian kid who's 17 years old named Henry. Um, and there were probably about 20 or 30 weight people in there that, who could have randomly been our weight person, but it was, it was my dad's name. And, and I, I said to my family, I said, did you, did you see, did you see, and Jesse said he was 10, when Jesse was 10 years old, Jesse said, yeah, dad, I saw that. I saw it at the beginning when we sat down, but with all this other stuff that's been going on, I just thought it was way too weird, so I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> so, so was that my dad? I don't know. I don't know. But it, was, it, would, it would be his behavior. It would be totally consistent with his behavior to look over everybody's shoulder, make sure he got the 21-gun salute, make sure everybody showed up on time. And it, 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 you know, everything was like clockwork. That was my dad. So who knows? So I raise these as, 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 as data points, so to speak, for us to think about. So continuing this transition idea, um, the idea that uh, uh, there may be a transition after the body dies and the mind may transition and continue. Has anybody here had experience where you, you've gone someplace you know you've never been before, but you go there and you go, this feels really familiar, you know, this is like, or, or, or even more familiar than that. Like, it feels like I've been here before. And I know I've never been here before. Anybody have had that experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people. So uh, I was just talking to a friend um, a few weeks ago, and she was saying the first time she ever, she was a model, and she flew into London. The first time she ever flew into London, it was like she felt like she'd been there before. She knows she's never been to London before. Uh, <laughs> She'd never been overseas before, probably, but you know, she was flying into London and had that experience. This is, this is what I call uh, recognition memories. They're inexplicable. They could be place-related. They could be related to things. It could be related to music. It could be related to anything. But there's some inexplicable recognition of the whatever we're talking about here. Happened to me when I was 20 years old. I went off to a foreign study program and I was studying in France, and it was one of these scenarios where, you, 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 you know, before the semester, since you're paying for the airfare anyway, you want to get there and take advantage of this. So before the semester starts, you get there like two, three weeks before, so you can travel around a little bit. So two of my buddies and I were, we were doing that, and we went down from France, we took a train down to Rome, to Italy. Never been there before. Went down to Rome, and one of the one of my friends said, hey, "Let's go along the Appian Way. Check it out, you know." And uh, I'd heard of the Appian Way. I didn't know much. I didn't read much history, but I wasn't a real history buff. But but these guys were, and um, and so they said, "Yeah, let's go to the Appian Way and let's go check out the catacombs." I didn't even know what the catacombs were. So we go to the catacombs. Anybody been to the cat in catacombs before? A number of people. Yeah. So you know what they. So for those of you who don't know. Um, Catacombs are basically, physically, it's a labyrinth of tunnels and small rooms. Why small? Because you've got to carve them out of the stone and the dirt and so forth. Uh, small little meeting rooms, but labyrinth of tunnels and so forth. And, and, and burial plots, I guess you would call them, it's just they're in the walls of the, of the, of, as you're walking down. And you're going down hundreds of feet. And um, early Christians met there in secret and had worshipped and had meetings and so forth in these catacombs. So I'm walking down there, and this is back, I was 20 years old, so this is a few years ago, right? And so now they probably have big tours that go through, and it's probably really well organized. When, I, when we were there, it was me, my, my two buddies from college, and maybe there were four other people and the tour guide, really intimate small group. And we're walking around, and he had, the tour guide has a flashlight. That's it. He's got a flashlight. And we're walking around. And you're down there, 100 feet, 150 feet, way down. And you could see, and they have roped, sections roped off. Don't go down there because, you know, you may never come back again because you can't see. And, you, and it just, it's just this maze of stuff. 
The point of the story is, I come back up to the surface. And if you had asked me, Kel, how long were you down there? I would have said, two things happened to me. I would have said, first of all, I have no clue how long I was down there. Five, uh, 10 minutes? Uh, an hour and a half? I had no idea. I was in time warp when, as soon as we started walking down there. And the second thing that happened to me when I came up, and this is when I was 20 years old, the second thing was that I felt like I had been there before or been to something like it before. Maybe not that exact catacomb, but I had been in catacombs before. Some really strong recognition memory. And I didn't even know what a catacomb was before my friends said, let's go to these, see these catacombs. So that kind of recognition memory. So who knows? You know, just another data point. Give you another example. It's a very good friend of mine. His nephew is now, I think, around three and a half years old. So I've known this child since he was two. Three and a half years old now. For the last year and a half, this little kid has been correcting people about issues related to astronomy. He's been correcting adults about the moons of Jupiter, for example. Now, has he ever seen a Discovery Channel before? Yeah, maybe he's seen the Discovery Channel once or twice, but I don't know if they like drilled him into, you know, like the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and even if you were two years old, how much are you going to retain of that? So these kind of odd data points, knowledge that where does that come from? You know? So again, I just raise these issues. Why? Because again, is this transition? Not sure what I think these recognition memories are precursors to deeper memories that people may possibly have. Um, fourth belief system. My body dies, my mind continues, and may go into some transition period, make a decision to come back in another body, the whole idea of reincarnation, past lives, future lives. Okay? Um, anybody see this story that was on Yahoo about three weeks ago, I saw it on Yahoo anyway, um, Yahoo News. This, this little boy, I think he's five years old now, so this started when he was about two, and he would sit with his mom, and he would say, she's putting her makeup on and her jewelry and stuff, he said, and he'd sit there on her lap, little two-year-old, I like those earrings, I had earrings like that too, and she's going, what's he talking about? She's, so he started to t t say these, tell these little stories to her about what seems to be another life. And she's just thinking he's got an imagination, a little two-year-old, you know? And then he gets more detailed and says, oh, I died in a fire in Chicago. They don't live in Chicago. Um, I died in a fire in Chicago, and this is how old I was, and this was my name. You're my mommy now. But this was another time. This is like two, three years old now. This is going on for six months, a year. The mother's getting more and more of these data points, I call them. So then she goes and researches this. And so now she's thinking, maybe there's still stories, but I got enough data points here to look some stuff up. She goes and looks some stuff up, finds out there was a woman of that name, of that age, who died in a fire in Chicago, who has the physical description that he's describing to her, has described to her. So, Again, who knows? Uh, past lives, proof of past lives? Not necessarily. I mean, it's an interesting, uh, another interesting data point, but certainly raises, raises the question, doesn't it? Um, but if you do believe in past lives, my approach, my thinking about past lives is as follows. Again, reference back to what I said earlier about me being a pragmatic idealist. So that practical side to me, I say, if I remembered something, I would take that's parts of the memory, especially, that would help me now today in my life today. 
and apply those principles, that knowledge, that knowingness of oneself today. Otherwise, who cares? It's kind of cocktail party talk. Otherwise, to me. Um, what, what, what might speak from that, that that helps improve our inner strength and confidence about who we are today? That kind of thing. So, if in this latter case, we do continue, what's the point of understanding or considering the belief system of past lives and reincarnation? Well, if you believe that particular belief about death, then no need to fear death, of course, because death is merely a transition. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a stopping point. It's a, it's a temporary stopping point, and then you continue. And if you have that belief system, then you probably believe that the mind is eternal. It continues. That the personality continues. One would then believe that one's personality continues pretty much intact, maybe incrementally changes over time, but pretty much same personality, different physical form, different life choices in different lifetimes. No need to fear death at all. Okay? So again, I want to emphasize, it doesn't matter which of the four belief systems you may have. And you may have a hybrid. A little bit of this. Um, I always wonder if my dad hedged his bets a little bit. You know? That would be totally within his personality type. And I also wonder if my dad was a little surprised after he died uh, that his mind may have continued. Who knows? But it doesn't matter what belief system you have. What matters is how you look at things, and regardless of which belief system you have, you can overcome the fear of death and thereby free up all kinds of energy that would otherwise be draining you. So apply that energy in whatever way you want and live a happier, more effective life. That's really the goal. <clears throat> 